A lot of people are afraid of the dark. Well, at least we were as kids. I know I didn't particularly like lights off, because my imagination ran rampant drawing all the gnarly, insidious beasts that come to feast on my flesh as soon as the ceiling lamp was out. It's part of what makes us human. Our desire to understand everything outside of our own being, which is embodied by, in this case, fear, founded upon curiosity. So we often forget to study what is the most complex thing besides the universe surrounding us, our own brain. Creativity and imagination are gifts which allowed us as human beings to create things like the wheel, mouse and keyboard, the axe. The creation of these objects is often stimulated by the input of the surroundings we find ourselves in, as well as the works preceding it. In essence, everything ever made is an iteration upon some earlier creation or discovery or the natural surroundings. Without the prior invention of the trackball, leading to Douglas Engelbart's wheel mouse, first GUI-driven computer with the desktop metaphor, Xerox Alto, wouldn't even exist. The chain of innovation isn't ever broken or restarted. In essence, every human invention can be tied to the prior existence of something else. Not to jump to assertions right off the bat, but Christianity was an invention based heavily off Judaism, as well as the pagan mythos preceding it. Now, I didn't come here to dispute whether the origins of this religion lie within evolution, because I'd have to work off the premise that everybody within the audience can concede on the validity of the theory. I prefer to work off historical facts, as well as human psychology, to challenge the veracity of Christian beliefs. Without further ado, I'd like to start off addressing what makes Christianity unique, the evolution of accepted doctrine. The ecumenical councils are conferences of ecclesiastical dignitaries and theological experts convened to discuss and settle matters of church doctrine and practice, in which those entitled to vote are convoked from the whole world in which secures the approbation of the whole church. The first seven, I repeat, seven, there are many more, councils were accepted as valid by both the Orthodox and Catholic Church. There isn't anything intrinsically wrong with discussing philosophy, the teachings of a supposed human-form deity who is no longer present and can communicate his thoughts. However, this wasn't a mere discussion of ideology. This was an establishment of orthodox and heterodox beliefs. At the first council of Nicaea, Arianism was labeled as heretical. The big dispute was over the form of Jesus. The orthodox belief was in the Trinity, such that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one eternal being. Arius' belief was that Jesus was subordinate to God and his existence was temporal. Again, both beliefs were based completely upon interpretations of the Old Testament as well as scriptures of the Apostles. Nowhere in the Bible itself does it proclaim explicitly what Jesus' true form is, whether he's God's alter ego or just God's puppet. However, Emperor Constantine banished Arius and his followers as they digressed from the commonly accepted belief. Belief. Funny thing is, after Constantine's death, his successor Julian, devotee of Rome's pagan gods, allowed heretics to return. However, four emperors down the line, Valens violently persecuted the formerly exiled dissenters. It seems the doctrine wasn't established by rationale, but rather the disagreement between two parties, with the bigger dog taking the bone. Later down the line, we see the iconoclasm. The Byzantine iconoclasm happened twice, once between 726 and 787, and the next between 814 and 842. There was always an opposition to imagery depicting anything holy, however, it wasn't until Emperor Leo III's reign that icons were banned and destroyed. Supposedly, this was motivated theologically by an old covenant interpretation of the Ten Commandments, which forbade the making and worshipping of graven images, or possibly, and more probably, the prestige of Islamic military successes in the 7th and 8th centuries. We all know how much Muslims enjoy their drawings of Muhammad. You see, the 7th century was quite literally the definition of the Dark Ages. The capital of the entire Roman Empire was long shifted from Rome to Constantinople, under the titular Emperor Constantine, the same guy who made Christianity the state's main religion. The Roman Empire as a whole was split into two administrative halves under Emperor Diocletian. Historians often dispute when the fall of the Western Roman Empire occurred, however, it's no dispute there was a strong decline in cultural and literary output, as well as decrease of trade and urbanization by the 6th century. The Italian peninsula was ravaged by the Gothic Wars. The Byzantine, or Eastern Roman Empire, was also suffering heavy losses of territory to the Islamic Caliphate. In times of desperation, people turn to any aid they have, and that's what made icons so scary to the church. You see, praying to an icon is like praying to something divine. It makes you closer to God. That's what the church was fearing. The fact that they couldn't enforce and monitor subjects' worship. Th them losing power was scary. Now, 
I'm not just going to toss out the somewhat obvious cynical conclusion that the church authorities are just looking for power of the plebs, that you know organized religion exists to enforce a social structure. No, I don't think that necessarily dismantles the beliefs. Anyways, the iconoclasm happened for some time, and Leo's son, Emperor Constantine V, held a council of Hyria, which declared icons unorthodox. 33 years later, in 787, the actual Seventh Ecumenical Council was held because, get this, the previous one was rejected, labeled uncanonical. So the church, probably the same officials attending both councils, considering the short time between the two, can't make up its own mind on one aspect. Because again, there is no concrete evidence as to whether or not icons are holy, it's just whatever the state heads want. Leon Constantine didn't like them, so they decided to make them illegal. After that, Leo IV who initially opposed the sanctity of icons, was moved by personal inclinations and political considerations to restore the icon validity. So, you know, the commonly held beliefs enforced by the church seem to be pulled out of thin air or made for sheer political power. I can further delve into the Great Schism, how the church divided into the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, because again, no one had any concrete evidence into what bullshit they have to buy into. The completely politically driven penance at Canossa, where Henry IV had to stand in the snow for four days in order to beg for Pope Gregory VII to remove his excommunication, not because he felt repentant, but because being excommunicated fucked him over as the Holy Roman Emperor. Or how the First Crusade ended in an epic death metal-like bloodbath where the disgruntled cannibalistic crusaders went in and turned Jerusalem's streets into rivers of blood. Or the Albigensian Crusade. Go and watch Sargon's video on that. Or the nasty backstory of Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. Alexander VI, a hilariously corrupt shithead. Or Martin Luther, the Council of Trent, and the subsequent establishment of Protestantism. Because some people didn't want to pay up 10% of their earnings to the rotten shithead who was the Pope. Dude, the fun goes on and on. Well, Christian establishments are dubious to say the least. However, not everyone assigns themselves to a denomination. A lot of people simply state they believe in God, His Son, and the words of the Holy Bible. Let's look at the latter two, shall we? The Old Testament likes to often be ignored by Christians. The new one apparently invalidates all the slavery, violent conquests of the eastern Mediterranean, a meteor shower burning down two cities because of apparent homosexuality, and how Lot caught in the middle of Sodom offered up his two daughters virginity, Job's punishments, you know, because God was bored, as well as a story preaching unquestionable belief. I mean, even the fact that Moses wasn't able to enter the promised land, being the faithful servant of God, because he got slightly cocky striking a rock and taking the credit for the water flowing out of it. I guess the Christians didn't really want a god who was an insecure despot, whose hobby was collecting foreskins. So here comes the New Testament, with Jesus being this totally summer of love type of dude, apparently far more forgiving and wise than his drunk dad in heaven. I don't want to get into whether or not Jesus was the Son of God before I even know whether or not this guy existed. Since there is no concrete evidence on his existence, I'll literally go to a Christian website to see what they can muster up. This site lists names of individuals, non-Christians, who apparently have some evidence supporting the idea of Jesus' existence. Thalus, 52 AD. Thalus is perhaps the earliest secular writer to mention Jesus, and he is so ancient his writings don't even exist anymore. Round of applause. Great start there. But Julius Africanus, writing around 221 AD, does quote Thalus, who previously tried to explain away the darkness occurring at Jesus' crucifixion. On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thalus in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. If only more of Thalus's record could be found, we might find more confirmation of Jesus' crucifixion. But there are some things we can conclude from this account. Jesus lived, he was crucified, and there was an earthquake and darkness at the point of his crucifixion. Okay, so, the glaring fact. 52 AD. Is this when Thalus was born, or is this when he made the record? I'll take the more lenient approach and presume that this is when he recorded the event. Well, Jesus died when he was 33. So, 
This record he made was about 20 years after his death. All right, so how many of you think you remember 9-11? No, seriously, check this video out by Bod Bits. Recollection of events degrades significantly over time. But we don't even have a written record. Rather, we're using a quote from Julius Africanus, a guy writing about this a century and a half later. Not really sure how we can use Thales' account as credible evidence, as the eclipse he cites happened couldn't have even happened. Moving swiftly on, we've got Tacitus. He was born 56 AD though, so again, he's not a primary source for the existence of Jesus, but let's take a look anyways. In his Annals of 116 AD, he describes Emperor Nero's response to the great fire in Rome and Nero's claim that the Christians were to blame. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Again, this isn't first-hand evidence. Tacitus is using some other anonymous source for the evidence of Jesus' crucifixion, and there's no evidence that that source wasn't mere propaganda. Looking further down the list, we see no hostile pagan accounts from someone who lived during the same time as Jesus. Huh. Let's look at a piece of hostile Jewish evidence, again, from a list of people who didn't exist the same time as Jesus. Josephus, 37 to 101 AD. In more detail than any other non-biblical historian, Josephus writes about Jesus in his Antiquities of the Jews in 93 AD. Josephus was born just four years after the crucifixion. He was a consultant for Jewish rabbis at an early age, became a Galilean military commander by the age of 16, and he was an eyewitness to much of what he recorded in the first century AD. Alright, that's a good start, so at least he has some credibility. Under the rule of Roman Emperor Vesapian, Josephus was allowed to write a history of the Jews. This history includes three passages about Christians, one in which he describes the death of John the Baptist, one in which he mentions the execution of James and describes him as the brother of Jesus Christ, and a final passage which describes Jesus as a wise man and the Messiah. There is much legitimate controversy about the writing of Josephus, because the first discoveries of his writings are late enough to have been rewritten by Christians who were accused of making additions to the text. Wow, talk about self-defeating evidence, but <laughs> let's go on. So to be fair, we'll examine a scholarly reconstruction stripped of a Christian embellishment. Now, around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who gladly accept the truth. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, or Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, but those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him was not disappeared. Well, this would be a mediocre piece of evidence, no better than Tacitus or Tiberius's were it to be actually true. But the author explicitly confesses that the validity of this shred of evidence is questionable and could be potentially fabricated. And this was the first evidence he lists for evidence from hostile Jewish accounts. I mean, this speaks for itself. Alright, no evidence for Jesus' existence during his lifetime. Let's look at to the person who is, despite his germ-free hands, largely responsible for Jesus' death, Pontius Pilatus. The only physical archaeological evidence that confirms the existence of Pilat is the Latin inscription found on a limestone block relating Pilat's tribute to Tiberius. The artifact, sometimes known as the Pilat Stone, was discovered in 1961 by an archaeological team led by Antonio Frova. It was found as a reused block within a staircase located in a semicircular structure behind the stage house of the Roman theater at Caesarea, the city that served as Rome's administrative center in the province of Judea. Okay. Great start. We're picking a fairly obscure bureaucrat whose only historical marker was a reused block in a staircase. Then we're going to create some letters he supposedly wrote to Herod the Tetrarch, a fairly well-documented ruler of Galilee at the time, 
But again, the validity of these letters regarding Jesus' execution hasn't been thoroughly examined. Seriously, all the results I see on these letters are from Christian sources. Supposedly, there are letters Pontius Pilate wrote to Seneca and Tiberius, a philosopher and the Roman emperor respectively. But um, the main source for such letters comes from W.P. Crozier, author of The Letters of Pontius Pilate. Perhaps unknown to the faithful, it's Crozier's first novel in a fictionalized account of what he imagined Pilate would write. In fact, reviews of the day reveal it to be a work of fiction. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So, uh, I suppose our only solid account for Jesus comes from the New Testament. Entirely written by the apostles, by the way. We don't have a section called Jesus. It's Mark, Luke, Peter, John, Paul, their own witness accounts of Jesus, the Acts, as well as letters and fantasies of Armageddon 666 and some other stuff. Well, if it's written by men, how is it the word of God again? But why bother creating Jesus? So what was it for? Why would they do this? Um, one is they needed new scriptures. Jesus is the new Moses and Elijah. They didn't like the way Judaism was working out. They needed new scriptures, so they needed a new Moses, they needed a new Elijah, so they just invented one. It was convenient to do that. It was the same reason Moses was invented in the first place. Uh, they also needed to establish a stable authority. Um, if it's based on revelations, then any Joe Blow can walk in and says, you know what, Jesus revealed to me that he changed his mind, you're all wrong. Uh, if you want to put a stop to that, you can say, Jesus was a historical person, he taught so-and-so, so-and-so taught me, and so we have a pedigree, what's your pedigree? Um, so you can actually try to put a control on it. Now, uh, it was a propaganda arms race in this sense, so the, the, to get rid of, to stop the revelation people, they created a historical and a pedigree situation, but then of course the response to that in this arms race was that people started inventing their pedigrees, uh, just as the first ones had been invented, so it, that didn't work out in the end, but uh, it is the logical progression of things, and Robert Price has shown that uh, Islam had a similar thing with the production of the Hadith. Uh, the Gospels are written for guides for missionary life, uh, how to deal with miracles, family, doubters, enemies, etc. These are stories that you tell to actually educate people about how to deal with certain things in life or what they mean. It was also a guide for explaining ritual, the baptism, Eucharist, martyrdom. What were these things? What did they mean? You would create a story that would do that. And explaining the Gospel itself, the salvation. Through parables, Mark Jesus says that he only taught in parables that conceal the truth, and that the truth is not that the parables are historically true, the truth is the allegorical meaning. And that's kind of a clue, because if Jesus taught that way, the evangelist could be teaching that way. The Gospels are just extended parables. Uh, and as John Dominic Crossan wrote a book, The Power of Parable, just recently, he makes this case, uh, that in fact the Gospels are just big parables, uh, using Jesus as the central character. So that's uh, Christianity uh, without Jesus. Thank you. Not sure how Christianity is Christianity without Jesus and the establishment, but let's look into God. Suppose this Christian didn't even think that Jesus was God's son, but rather simply a good preacher spreading the word of God. This will address the three Abrahamic religions, I think altogether, as well as other religions who assert God's existence. Let's not look at the scientific evidence opposing God's existence, as well as the inconsistencies in the Bible. Rather, let's look at our own brain driving our belief in God. I'll be quoting Justin Barrett, PhD, Director of Cognition, Religion, and Theology Project in the Center of Anthropology and Mind at Oxford. There is no one cognitive tendency that undergirds all our religious beliefs. It's really your basic garden variety cognitions that provide the impetus for religious beliefs. A 2008 study in science by Jennifer Whitson and Adam Galinsky found that people were more likely to see patterns in a random display of dots if the researchers first primed them to feel that the participants had no control. This finding suggests that people are primed to see signs and patterns in the world around them. Why do you think every web page harasses you with CAPTCHA? Because it's quite difficult to develop an algorithm to decipher various symbols. We as human beings, on the other hand, can quite easily, most of the time, Decipher it, because we are, as the research suggests, primed to see patterns in the world around us. In 2008, University of Washington students created a game, Fold It, where the players literally unfold and untangle strands of proteins. 
pretty easy for us human beings since we can recognize patterns easily and notice breaks within these patterns. It's a high score game where the users are somewhat abstracted from the fact that they've unfolded actual strands, helping in the research in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Kurtzfeld Jacob diseases. Hence the belief in an intelligent designer. Because we can see the golden ratio in nature, because a lot of trig hangs on Euler's number, because we can emulate leaf patterns with fractals, because there's just so much goddamn logic in nature, we'll jump to the conclusion that there was an intelligent designer. But correlation does not equal causation. People also have a bias for believing in the supernatural. What we're showing is that our basic cognitive equipment biases us towards certain kinds of thinking and leads to thinking about a pre-life, an afterlife, gods, invisible beings that are doing things, themes common to most of the world's religions. The basic equipment includes a memory system that appears to be exceptionally good at remembering the kinds of stories found in many religious texts. In particular, research finds that we most easily recall stories with some, but not too many, counterintuitive or supernatural elements. In one study published in 2006 in Cognitive Science, Scott Atron and Nara Narenzian tested people's recall of concepts that ranged from intuitive, a grazing cow, to just slightly counterintuitive, a cursing frog, to extremely counterintuitive, a squealing, flowering brick. Although people more easily remembered the intuitive stories an hour after reading them, a week later they were more likely to remember the slightly counterintuitive stories. This finding held up in both American college students and Maya villagers from the Mexican Yucatan, suggesting that stories with a few minimally counterintuitive elements, such as those found in many religious stories, are more easily remembered and, presumably, more readily transmitted from person to person, says Narenzian. We don't have to go far to see how counterintuitive, shocking ideas are memorable, easily propagated throughout society. Look at Marilyn Manson. The guy's a great musician, but his persona was so countercultural in our culture of ignorance and feel goodisms, as well as his lyrics, that he propelled himself to the front line of everyone's mind, as well as the media. The people in high school didn't know any of his songs, though. They all heard the rumor that he removed the rib so he could fillet himself. Religion is just as audacious, and that's why it's so memorable. Everyone forgets the mundane story about some average person standing smoking a cigarette silently, but it's not so easy to not think of a guy that came back from the dead and ascended to heaven. The doubts within our own mind only perpetuate, amplify the idea. That's why you can't easily sleep after you've seen a horror movie. It's counterintuitive, thus you tend to doubt it to pacify yourself, that somebody planted microchips in Halloween masks to make kids' heads explode. Seriously, that movie is fucking hilarious. It's strange to me why people like to jump to conclusions before analyzing the evidence before them and applying some basic sense, how they could devote their entire lives to some ethereal being whose existence isn't manifested in any form within our collective reality. I'll, uh, I'll add a comment of my own. I think many people believe because they are simply afraid of the unknown. That monster under your bed, in the dark, you don't know that it isn't there. Thus you have to call in your mom or dad to check, to clear your mind. You simply can't accept the fact that you don't know whether or not he's there. There's a drive for all humans for knowledge. However, many satisfy that urge by simply jumping to conclusions. Thus we end up with things like the collectivist mentality. It's too difficult to judge individuals on their merits because the human brain is limited by Dunbar's number. And because we don't want to accept the fact that much of the demographic that we group under a label is unknown to us, we prescribe something to them by default, whatever stereotype our in-group pushes. I presume the same thing applies to the afterlife. We don't want to accept the fact that we don't know anything about the death of the conscious, thus we simply assume something happens. Though modern studies have shown that our conscious, our identity, is our brain. Thus, when your brain dies, you cease to exist. But people don't care, and I guess that spills more into willful ignorance. Now... Religion without a contemplative element may change certain brain circuits, according to research by University of Toronto psychologist Michael Inslicht. His work focuses on a brainwave generated by the anterior cingulate cortex called error-related negativity, which spikes when people make mistakes. It is our cortical alarm bell, an uh-oh response that is pre-conscious and emotional. When we make an error, it's arousing, 
causing slight anxiety. In a study published last year in Psychological Science, he measured this uh-oh response in people who performed a standard color naming Stroop task. Even though all of the 28 study participants made mistakes, the ERN firing was less strong in people with more religious zeal and greater belief in God. They're calmer and more graceful under pressure. In a second set of studies, published in August in Psychological Science, Inslicht and his colleagues tested whether people who are born with a lower ERN response gravitate towards religion, or whether religion actually lowers this uh-oh response. They asked participants to write about religion or something that makes them happy, and found that those who wrote about religion had a lower ERN response, suggesting that religion dampens this anxious response. Inslicht believes religion's effect may come from its ability to make people calmer overall by explaining phenomena we don't understand. <laughs> this difference occurs in only a few hundredths of a second, but we propose that a lifetime of having less intense reactions can lead to a lifetime of being calmer. Do I even have to comment here? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> We invest so much time and effort into worshipping, instead of looking at the insane computer we all have and attempting to comprehend what and why we're thinking. Metacognition, something it seems not a lot of people engage in. It's funny seeing a gazillion Christian denominations fighting and condemning each other. You know why? Because the Christians have no idea what the fuck Christ was talking about half the time. It's brilliant fables that can be misconstrued and interpreted 500 ways, depending upon the assertions you apply analyzing as preaches. It's almost like the Bible with some metaphorical work. You know, I'll put on my tinfoil hat, but what if there was some hidden message behind Adam and Eve's tale in Genesis? What if the apple of Eden, the fruit of knowledge, simply was one to break them out of their belief in God and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden was simply the escape from bliss. It was being released from the plush shackles of ignorance out to accept the grim world's reality. I don't know. And I know I didn't convince any of the Christians within my audience. As a Christian friend of mine told me, when I tossed some facts in his directions, it's just to understand God, you have to believe hard enough. Just cognitive dissonance. He couldn't find a rebuttal to what I said. He just accepted the facts and said, you just don't know that feeling, you know, the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And maybe I don't, maybe I never will. Because I think skepticism requires more than simply the ability to accept facts. It also demands the ability to doubt. And as unfortunate as it may be, I guess some people simply don't have that. Probably never will. Thanks for watching.